Driving at home with Avor's housing economist, Claire Losey. Okay, guys, we're back with another Driving at Home with Dr. Claire Losey. Claire, how are we doing today? Doing well. How are you? Good, good, good. It's almost Christmas, so we'll get there one day. Yeah, <laughs> excited for the holidays. I know. Well, I think we're going to start by looking at the jobs report specific to the Austin area, our local jobs report. What did you find in that report this month or for the October date? So on a year-over-year basis, job growth increased about 3%, a little under that. So as we talked about in last week's podcast, still a pretty good number showing a resilient labor market, but not quite as high as of the number as we've seen in months past. But of course, we're now entering more of this anomalous comparison as we are fully recovered from the pandemic and we're not in that kind of recovery phase, if you will, after the pandemic in which we saw this exorbitant job growth that was really reflective of the job losses we had seen early on in the pandemic. So we're entering a more normal pace within the labor market. But specifically as to the breakdown of jobs by industry, and here in work, which we're talking about manufacturing jobs, leisure and hospitality, financial activities, just the different sectors, mining, logging, and construction posted really strong year-over-year growth to the tune of 8% in October. And that's partially a factor of actually something called cryptocurrency mining. Mm. And please no one send me any questions on this because (laughs) I am by no means an expert. But essentially just this growth right in technology that is mined itself of that makes any sort of sense. So by mining, they don't mean minerals and not in the traditional sense. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. That's an interesting coupling, though, cryptocurrency mining and like actual logs and sticks and construction all together. It does require those resources, but it's a different type, as you were alluding to, a different type of mining than we typically envision. And then you do have the typical rock quarries along the hill country. This is for the entire MSA, so it's encapsulating more of the Marble Falls, Bernie area. So some of that. So of that 8% increase in that sector, how much of that could we hope is actually directly associated with construction and potentially housing? So that is going to be certainly a higher proportion of that figure, just because we've seen pretty robust construction activity, especially among single family homes. The multifamily sector has decelerated to a certain extent Mm. just because of access to capital, right? Multifamily developers had this initial boom in the wake of the pandemic and even in the Austin market. And even as mortgage rates were increasing in early to mid-2022, they multifamily was still performing relatively well, while, of course, single family was moderating. But now it's it's not necessarily flipped, but multifamily is slowing its trajectory, so to speak. But yes, with respect to construction, that's going to be more so single family nowadays. Um, We can't put an exact estimate to that number, but yes. But it's not all crypto mining. No, not (laughs) at all. That's good. That's a good thing for housing. And then with respect to strong growth in other industries, that would include education and health services, professional and business services, and other services, which is that third industry is a catch-all for jobs that don't make it into the other industries. We did see a slowdown in manufacturing to the tune of about 0.7% on a year-over-year basis and also decline in information also to the tune of 0.7% year-over-year. And of course, we've seen that tech firms are struggling with access to capital themselves. There's just not as much financing available to them as investors are looking towards other alternatives, other options in the market. I guess, though, That feels negligible in the context of the loss that we've seen in tech industries at a national level. Like, I think that's, again, a mirror of Austin continues to sort of experience bumps and blips, but not deep dips in the way that those industries experience it at a more global or national level. Absolutely. And that's a really good way of phrasing it is that the information sector, by and large, has maintained its status quo, more or less, or kind of, it's at sort of a maintenance pace, yeah. I guess like you could a, say. Like a shy of 1% feels not impactful 
Absolutely. In context, cool. for sure, for sure. So that's kind of an overview of, of job growth among the different industries in yeah. Austin. In I mean, October. I think that speaks to continued demand to, you know, the fact that we continue to also grow in sectors that drive relatively steady wages, which they'll need to continue to compete in this marketplace, and that that is another factor of stability for Central Texas. Yeah, when we think about more sectors more like information and financial services or financial activities, they're generally higher paying mm-hmm. sectors, but you're right, there's there could be more volatility and they're more recession prone, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Or yeah. downturn prone. We won't say that word, but yes. <laughs> downturn prone. <laughs> I liked how you couched it differently, just to accommodate <laughs> our fears. Um that's cool. So I think too we were gonna start to preview the stats that are coming out. Where are we at this month for stats releases? On a year-over-year basis, sales were essentially flat, up a very modest 0.2% in light of, of course, higher mortgage rates in September, October, and November of this year on a year-over-year basis to the tune of 1.1 percentage points in September, 0.7 percentage points in October, and about 0.6 percentage points in November. That's pretty good performance um, for, for closed sales. We have seen a moderation with respect to the median sales price and prices, more generally speaking, on a year-over-year basis down about 8.4%. This is not necessarily surprising, again, given just the higher rate environment that we saw late this summer and moving into the fall. Of course, with the decline in in the median sales price, it's also a factor just the fact that buyers themselves have more inventory from which they can choose. Yeah. So we know active listings, they're up about 7% on a year-over-year basis in November. So again, buyers just can afford to be more selective and sellers realize that they have to be more accommodative of buyers' pricing. And two, we've seen a little bit of an uptick in the close to original list price on a year-over-year basis. So Mm. some indication that Sellers are listening a little bit more carefully to their realtors and pricing things a little bit more closely the first time around to the actual sales price itself. But that ratio itself was about 94% in November, and it's still lower on average than it has been prior to the pandemic. So there's still indication that there's some reluctance among sellers to the first time around realize that. The housing market has shifted a little bit, so certainly a lot of latitude for realtors to tap into their clients and say, hey, I really am the expert on the ground. I've had my boots on the ground for years now, and I can tell you, you know, I can help you price your home most accurately. I think, too, as I think about a seller struggling to accept what is reasonable and what the market will bear and and the agent's conversations with them. So much of that depends on the level of motivation that they have. Am I moving because I have to or am I just considering it and I'm walking away from an interest rate that's really palatable and and reasonable right now into a situation that's not as comfortable as I'm used to? All of that drives their motivation around list price, too, to some degree. And so I think we're seeing people settle into how motivated are you to sell? If you're really motivated, we need to price in a way that is competitive and and that pushes a little bit. And in some cases, they're not as motivated, but they'll test the waters. And right. and that's buyers are navigating that and seeing through it sometimes and accepting that others. Um, and so I think it's reasonable to think that coming out of such volatility in the marketplace, just learning how to price and working around those motivations is going to dictate some of that list to close, too. Absolutely. That's a really good point. And two, we have to consider the fact that as a seller, you've seen just the home equity gains during the pandemic. And it's it's a lot more difficult from a psychological standpoint to forego that higher sales price that you know you might have been able to get, for example, during yeah. the height of the pandemic. Although I think the farther we get out from the years of total chaos... <laughs> The the farther we, you know, that that's in the rearview mirror, the more we settle into what's my equity today. And that, I mean, you know, we don't count chickens till they, egg, eggs till they hatch, chicken, something like that. I've never been <laughs> good at those the things. Goes. But, 
There are no chickens. If they're not in your basket is, is the thing. And it's you just have to agents have to work to reframe the conversation in the context of today's market, the equity that you have today, an understanding of your motivations and why you're moving and what's coming next. And same with their buyers in terms of how good a deal you're going to get is dependent on what you want and where you want to buy it, too. And to throw a bone to the sellers, too, mortgage rates did increase pretty rapidly over the kind of final summer months and into the fall. So yeah. it's it's also difficult to price something accurately the first time around when, you know, buyers are responding to real-time changes in mortgage rates. And not only what is the house worth, it's also who can buy it. Right. And can they afford that? And they're their ability, their buying power shifted significantly over the fall. That changes on a weekly basis. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of weekly basis, what do our weekly numbers say? Good question. Essentially, you know, moving into winter months, we know that weekly stats are generally going to be a little bit slower just due to seasonality. So with respect to last week on a week over week basis, closed sales were down about 44%. Active listings were down about 9%. And then on the leasing side, active leases were down about 13% and closed leases were down about 45%. When we're looking at the comparison for the same weeks last year, we see very similar trends. For example, this week, last year on a week-over-week -week basis, closed sales were down 38%, active listings down about 3%, and then closed leases down about 39%. You're lagging, too, and Thanksgiving the week prior, this all feels very consistent with what we should expect. Holidays always mess up, for lack of a better <laughs> phrase, kind of mess with the weekly stats and jumble right. the numbers to a certain extent. So I would just say, hold on and, and don't pay necessarily too much attention to the weekly stats during this holiday season, again, when they're going to be more yeah. variable naturally. Yeah, totally agree. And I guess what we hope for agents, too, is that they're able to find a little bit of time in this quiet to focus on what their business building activity looks like going into next year. If their pipelines are ready for next year, this is that time that you close out what worked and didn't work this year and begin to anticipate for into next year. And I know that on a couple of special driving at homes, we're going to take that look back, look at what has happened through the course of 2023, but also offer some predictions and ideas about what we expect for 2024. So hopefully we'll empower you guys to be in your business thinking about what's coming next. Absolutely. Awesome. Claire, thank you so much for your time and we'll talk again next week. Sounds great. Thanks for having me guys.